Welcome to the show, Israel. Uh, Dr. E. Michael Jones is here. Uh, he wrote a book, he called it an e-book. Uh, it was in two editions of The Culture Wars. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. The Man Behind the Curtain, Michael Voris and the Homosexual Vortex. And that was July and August. And then in September, it was part two. And I've been spending quite a bit of time going through it because there's a lot of issues that kind of come to a head here. Uh, I think there's an Old Testament scripture that might apply uh, quickly, and there's a lot of New Testament scriptures, but I don't, we, we don't want to uh, hit them right away. Chapter 13 of Zechariah, In that day there shall be a fountain open to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will cut off the names of the idols out of the land, and they shall no more be remembered. And also I will cause the prophets and the unclean spirit to pass out of the land. And it shall come to pass that when any shall yet prophesy, then his father and his mother that begat him shall say unto him, Thou shalt not live, for thou speakest lies in the name of the Lord, and his father and his mother that begat him shall thrust him through when he prophesieth. And it shall come to pass in that day that the prophets shall be ashamed every one of his vision when he hath prophesied, neither shall they wear a rough garment to deceive. But he shall say, I am no prophet, I am an husbandman, for man taught me to keep cattle from my youth. Um, I'm not saying that applies, you know, directly here, but it, it's... Um, it's indicating that they were having people coming out and speaking in the name of the Lord, and it was causing a lot of trouble. Yep. And it shows you the necessity that people <clears throat> be first vetted by the church, that you don't go out. Right, right. So what you've had here is basically 50 years of crisis in the Catholic Church uh, following the Second Vatican Council and various responses to that crisis and various people stepping forward and saying, uh, I'd like to address the crisis. I am one of the people who did this, okay? Uh, I've been doing this for 35 years, so uh, it's not, uh, I'm not completely, uh, it's not a completely strange idea to me. But it's become, uh, I guess, kind of institutionalized at this point, and there's certain expectations, I think, that uh, a culture creates in this regard. The, 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 the result here, um, the net result is disunity. And we haven't had unity in the Catholic Church for so long that everyone has become habituated to the lack of unity. And so basically you establish your identity as one faction or another faction. But you never just identify yourself as Catholics. And of course, this plays right into the hands of the enemies of the Church who create uh, gang and counter-gang scenarios as a way of weakening the opposition. So it's almost like the Middle East. I mean, how it's, they... very, it's very similar, but basically we're talking about one of the strategies of psychological warfare, and that's been in existence for, you know, the same longer than the crisis in the Catholic Church. As a matter of fact, what this psychological warfare uh, operation did was precipitate the crisis in the Catholic Church. They're not, they're not unrelated. Uh, we have this, you know, the story of John Courtney Murray and the role he played in basically undermining the traditional teaching of the church on church and state. Uh, Malachi Martin, uh, a, a, another agent working for the Jews, trying to undermine the tr church's traditional teaching on the Jews um, uh, in the document Nostra Aetate. So psychological warfare was the preparation. It was successful insofar as it created division in the church. And you had basically now, you have Catholics who are, are you a Democrat Catholic or are you a Republican Catholic? Are you a liberal Catholic or are you a conservative Catholic? And the reason this, this became apparent to me because I just got back from Tanzania. And Tanzania is a place where they don't have this. They have unity. If there's one thing Tanzania has, it's unity. And this is largely the result of the president, first president, Julius Nerera, who created a country based on 120 different ethnic groups and created a unified country. What happened after that was problematic, but, but he did create that. And the church in East Africa has this type of unity. So you see the conflict uh, there when they bump into these people. They're Catholics who uh, say that there's nothing wrong with homosexual behavior. The, the East African church finds this 
unbelievable that someone <laughs> could say something like this. Right. Uh, a, a priest I was with went to San Francisco, and he's having a big argument about gay marriage with a fellow Catholic priest. And it turns out, guess what? The guy who's defending gay marriage announces he's a homosexual. So you have this division. You, know, you have the sexual subversion of the Catholic people creating division as well. Right. And the, the typical uh, disunity is if you say, when I, tell, when I go back home, I say, well, Notre Dame teaches evolution. Or the Catholic Church teaches evolution. They can't believe it. When, how, how can they? Well, it's, one, it's like one thing after another. In other words, what we have here is an incredibly powerful uh, propaganda machine broadcasting the message of the empire and the Catholics are the recipients of this message and there's always the temptation to want to offer up incense to, to idols. Look at, look at the, uh, the Democrat uh, nominee for vice president. You know, I mean, he's a Catholic. He completely, wherever the, ca the, the uh, agenda of the empire contradicts the Catholic faith, well, he chooses the empire. Joe Biden, another vice president, did the same thing. He's been a, a faithful servant of the empire for his entire career as a Catholic politician. How does that fit in with, okay, Henry Clay, Calhoun, and Webster, the big three statesmen? My understanding, they all three said it's going to be impossible to hold this nation together because they, the church is split over slavery. So that there was only one Baptist church, one Presbyterian, one Methodist, but they all split over slavery, and they said we can't hold... You can't hold it together without some kind, without spiritual unity. So how do you hold this? What's holding the empire together? Capitalism. That became the default setting. The, the founding fathers always viewed religion with suspicion. They always felt that it was divisive. And so their, their solution to this was to promote as many sects as possible. The sects can say whatever it wants as long as it doesn't try to influence public policy. And this carried through... Uh, the big return of this came after World War II when basically the, the Protestant ministers created this separation of church and state. It's in a letter. It's, you know, yeah, the, the famous statement of the South Bend Tribune when Bill Moore apparently freaked out about something you did and he said in a letter to the editor, and that's why the separation of church and state is part of our constitution. Well, it's not part of the Constitution. Right, right. It's a letter that Jefferson wrote to clergymen. But the point here is we're trying to eliminate religion from any type of influence on public life. Now, the Protestant sects were easy, in a sense, to play off against each other. And that's pretty much what happened. They, they gradually settled into a point of insignificance. They basically supported the regime uh, uh, understood the regime's understanding of, of the church and state relationship. The last one left was the Catholic Church, and that was basically the whole story of John Courtney Murray and Vatican II, and so on and so forth. So at that point, we became divided. The people in, as I said, East Africa, they don't have a big empire with all that high-energy radiation coming out of the propaganda machine, so they really don't need to, to compromise in the way that the pressure is put on people here to compromise, okay, compromise the faith. So, I mean, to get back to, to our story, um, you know, Michael creates this operation. It reaches, it, it scratches the people where they itch. No, for, for people watching, there should be some things. I mean, he graduated from Notre Dame. He's from Detroit. Yeah. Okay, I graduated. I was class of 74, but I took out a few years. I think he's about 10 years younger than he's you. He's about nine years younger. He's my sister's age, my youngest yeah. sister. So he, he grew up in Detroit. That's a factor, okay? Because the main thing here about, uh, which we learned from Dr. Austin, I mean, he's the one that informed me that homosexuality is probably, the main cause is poor peer connection. And so you have to look at where he grew up. I mean, you grew up in Philly. I grew up in a small town. And the peer interaction was intense. I mean, just intense. It'd be impossible almost that somebody could be gay where I grew up. And we didn't know anybody in our class because I think there was a yeah. lot of healthy... Yeah, he talks a lot about peer pressure. I mean, the classical explanation is uh, relationship with the father. In other words, weak father, dominant mother, uh, who cre creates a deficit, male deficit. And the male deficit is then 
uh, as the, the child reaches puberty, uh, there are predators out there that sexualize this feeling of deficit, and it becomes a sexual uh, uh, addiction at this point. But, but, but that's also an interesting critique. What's, what's, what's happening in America as far as normal, healthy peer uh, interaction? You know, the play, you know, when you're five years old, you go off and play with your friends. Well, obviously, what's happened over this period of time is an attack on the family and on fatherhood in particular, and malehood in general. So it, as you have this, you're going to have more and more people who are going to feel insecure about their masculinity. And uh, Michael was evidently one of these people. And apparently, I don't know, who knows, he told me stories about incidents at Notre Dame where priests tried to seduce him. I don't know whether that's... I can trust these, these stories anymore. Because there was a fundamental... I mean, I, I had dealings with him. I was on his show. I have no personal animus against him. He always uh, treated me decently. We always... I think we worked well together. But it was under false pretenses. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm sorry, but this is a big deal. Mm -hmm. And the point of the matter, one of the reasons I wrote the article is we basically live in a culture that's trying to claim that uh, homosexuality is no different than... Uh, the color of your skin. It has no moral significance whatsoever. Well, that's preposterous. And I think that part of what the reason, it, you have this confluence of all of these factors uh, in coming into with this story. So as I said, we, we were working together, and then suddenly he, he, the story basically is that uh, his past is starting to catch up with him. There's this inevitable trajectory here. The more well-known he becomes, the more people who are associated with his homosexual past become aware of him, and the more they start logging on and sending messages, you know, and the, through the Internet. But you would have thought, I mean, didn't he foresee no, that? No, this is, this is the interesting thing, because uh, Robert Sirica is in exactly the same situation. He was a homosexual. He, he kind of recreates himself as a priest, and as the guru on Austrian school economics. But he knew, he, he was even more notorious than Michael Voris. And he knew, he must have known, he told, he told people, I know, they've told me, that uh, my past is going to catch up with me. There's something about this, I think, that is peculiarly homosexual. It's, I think they want their past to catch up with them. I think there's an element among the homosexuals who want to be punished they know they're doing something wrong, and they want to be punished. And if the society doesn't punish them, they punish themselves. Well, I think I think <clears throat> I this, think that probably is something that's pretty obvious in a sense. This first of all, Midge Dector said this in her article, "The Boys on the Beach." She said, "As soon as the police stopped busting people in bars in New York City, that was the beginning of sadomasochism." So uh, let's take uh, Michel Foucault, another famous homosexual. Uh, he was on the top of the world. I mean, basically, he was the guy. He was the philosopher king uh, in the 70s. He could, had, in a sense, the freedom to do whatever he wanted to do. They gave him a chair at Berkeley. He was just the guy. So what did he do? Give him total freedom? He punished himself. He would go to the bathhouses of San Francisco and engage in sadomasochistic Activity because he wanted to be punished. He even said that, you know, they, he hated the Enlightenment state because the Enlightenment state thought of homosexuality as a phob disease or something like that. It's a sin. It's a crime, right. and people should be taken out and punished for it. You know, one way or the other. Well, I mean, that's why. I mean, Christianity is Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, took our punishment. I mean, yeah. So there's. A, so I think that we have something here that both Voris and uh, Sirica knew that their past was going to catch up with them. And in many ways, I think they, they wanted it to. Sure. Because, because it, it's, it, it stopped them from leading this double life, because both of them were leading double lives. I was the one who exposed Sirica, or for, let's say Culture Wars magazine exposed Sirica. It was Tom Heron's article that did it, but we were the ones who exposed it. Uh, but I think he wanted it. I, because now it's out in the open. Now I can say, oh, yeah, that was all in the past. And now I'm, I'm a saint. I'm a holy guy. I'm a priest. I wear the Roman collar. And you should listen to me on Austrian school economics. 
So he never stopped subverting church teaching. He's always been a subversive. Now it's just subverting it, uh, the uh, economic teaching. Well, that goes to the main theme, is that uh, once, you, once you've internalized this homosexual mindset to a point of neurosis, then the, the Protestant notion or the Lutheran notion that all you got to do is say the prayer. Right. So there's the other stream that flows into this thing. You got the dominant culture saying homosexuality is no big deal, it's just a lifestyle. And then you have the Protestant idea of cheap grace, which is basically, you know, you hear all, go to the altar, you say, I'm saved, you know, get, do that, do the altar call, and then it's all obliterated. Your whole past is obliterated. And that's why I brought in, Huck Finn has a classic, uh, Mark Twain, the idea of pap, you know, see that hand, that were the hand of a hog. You know, so he, everybody cheers, and the sinner has been saved. He goes up, he gets thirsty, he decides he's going to have a drink. After all, climbs down, breaks his arm, nearly freezes to death, and it's a, a, a parody. It's, it's a satire on the whole notion of cheap grace. So let's put it this way. Okay, let's take, let me accept your claim that you are uh, admitted that you've gone to confession, you confessed your sin. Okay. That doesn't change the fact that you're still a, a, a damaged person. And what is the, the damage? Uh, you still have these inclinations. If you're an alcoholic, you're still going to crave a drink yeah. sooner or later. And you're going to have to. So what you're in a, you have to, uh, you're in a situation where how many years did a, of bad habits did it take you to get to the situation you're in now? Do you think that's going to change overnight? You know, is, you, is your liver, your liver is shot, okay? That's not going to change overnight. That's a metaphor well, for the fact that you need to take some time to, re, to, to get good habits to replace the bad habits, and habits take time. Well, you can see, you know, I was in the jail for about eight years, county jail. And, of course, you, after eight years, you kind of see what really goes on. You say the sinner's prayer, people get up and say the prayer, and you're tempted to go, wow, I'm really... People are getting saved. They're saying the prayer. Not that you. There's more that you do, and then there's the appearance that somebody now as old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now here's a new creation in Christ. Well, the reality is, when they get out, those habits almost always take them over. The recidivism rate is unbelievable. Yeah. Okay. So you have to question the theology behind that because the theology says, when they when they confess with their mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in their heart, God raised him from the dead. Yeah. Well, that's the Protestant version, okay, and it leaves out a lot. St. John Chrysostom uh, had a different view. I quote him in the article. We're saying basically, okay, the sin is an arrow. The arrow goes in, okay, you remove the arrow, but the wound is still there, mm -hmm. you know? And, and so how does, this, how does this manifest itself? Basically, you've got a guy who engaged in all kinds of uh, unnatural acts, shameful acts, the type that uh, St. Paul describes at the beginning of uh, Romans. And, okay, even if you say you're sorry, you have this sense of self-loathing, you know, that you actually did that disgusting thing. Mm -hmm. And it comes back to you, and it's intolerable. So Correct. what happens when you have this intolerable feeling of self-loathing? Well, you have to project it away. Because this is, this is we're, we're talking about the, the primal wound here is narcissism. The wound is too heavy. Now, I'll have a self-loathing because if I violate the laws that govern our sexual, you know, the commandments, in other words, if you even look at a woman, okay, so if I cross that line, I'm going to have, uh, there's a wound there, right? You, you're wounded, but you recover, it's, the recovery, the wound is insignificant compared to the wound that if you're full-fledged in the homosexual lifestyle. Well, first of all, yeah, we have to, we're talking about sins a, a, a hierarchy here, or Lewis would say a lowerarchy of, okay, there's fornication, okay, that's a sin, okay, because you're jeopardizing uh, the unborn child, the life of an unborn child here. And some a people child, don't recover from that. I've met people in the, in the mental institution that didn't recover from an adulterous affair. Okay, well, wait a minute, you're jumping ahead here. Adultery is a step lower. Okay. You know, or a step worse, because you've made a vow and you violated the vow in addition to all the problems that you can have because of fornication. But even with fornication and adultery, we're still within the realm of, of nature. 
Right. Okay, and then you can take the step below that, and now you're out of the realm of nature. Well, this is really has a terribly deranging effect on your personality that no one wants to talk about. Okay, I, you know, I'll get in trouble if I talk about how the homosexuality has a bad effect on you. That's a bad, you're a bad person if you say this kind of stuff now, but that's obviously what's happening here. Mm -hmm. And so all this accumulated self-loathing is just building and building and building. And in many ways, uh, repentance is not going to solve the problem of self-loathing, is it? And maybe it will increase your sense of self-loathing. But there's Maybe that's a good thing. thing because of the truth. They're thinking about what, it, in the truth of what they are confronted with, they can't find a way. The truth just keeps hitting them. That's so. Wrong. How do you deal with it? How do you deal with it? Well, the one way is you can have penance, and you kind of withdraw and try and let this thing heal. In the early church, it could have been three to five years for these types of sins. Yeah. That you were. You were We've you, lost the notion. We Catholics have lost the notion of penance. It was literally it's basically, it's basically you go to confession, you just say three Hail Marys, and that's it. But literally, you could be on bread and water in some circumstances. Yeah, or you can wear sackcloth and ashes, or you can, like Barbarossa, you can stand barefoot in the snow. Uh, but, you know, we've lost the notion that some... But, so psychology has taken it over, and basically the psychologists are now saying that uh, you really have to go for a couple of years before you make any momentous decisions because this force field is so distorting, you're not going to be able to perceive reality. Well, that was the problem here. He could mm -hmm. not perceive reality. So he jumps into the crisis in the church. Yes, there is a crisis in the church, but your narcissistic homosexual uh, mindset is not going to solve that problem. But it's not just... You're not going to perceive the problem correctly. You're going to exacerbate the problem because what you're doing here is now you've created an engine that will take the self-loathing and project it outward in a really powerful way. And now, because you are now the great church reformer who's holding a sword. I mean, for God's sake, he has one picture of himself riding a horse holding a sword. I mean, if this isn't a narcissistic fantasy, I don't, I don't know what the term means. Well, do, people probably know of other people. Like I, I'm thinking of C.I. Schofield, Doctor Schofield. Okay, he was a notorious. He was lying. He was a. He was the Attorney General of Kansas, and after six months, they had to kick him out. He would forge notes. He'd lie. It was unbelievable. And he has a conversion. Three years later, he's the head of a big church in Dallas. And they said, "Well, he's no longer a drunk." Like, like I don't think he even. I don't think he drunkenness was a big problem to him myself. But they made out like that was it. But he continued to lie. He, that was, he was never purged. It had a devastating effect. You know, some people said his, his Schofield's notes was the biggest spiritual disaster of the 20th century. Yeah. So these things happen. Yeah, Christian Zionism is the result of all right. this disaster. Because in th within three years after getting saved, he's leading a big church. And yeah, so here you have the problem. You've got the problem here. You're, you've got this narcissistic uh, wound that is basically at the root of your homosexuality. You repudiate the homosexuality. In other words, you pull out the arrow, but the wound is still there. And now the wound is taking this fantasy in a different direction. Now you've got a, you created a vehicle whereby you can project your self-loathing onto someone else, like an authority figure, mm -hmm. like Cardinal Dolan, so let's say. You know, and you can whip the crowd up into a frenzy because in many ways we're all part of this problem. We all got the problem one way or the other. We got sexual problems, we got authority problems, we got gossip problems, we got all kinds of problems. And we here, all we all cross the line. And 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 here's a guy who can come and mobilize it. And mobilize and in by mobilizing it, he gets paid to stand in front of a camera and project his self loathing onto uh, an authority figure in the church. Well, the people who want the vision in the church love this kind of stuff. They absolutely love it. So suddenly you got uh, something going here. But the problem is that his homosexual past is starting to creep up on him. And he doesn't know what, how, quite how to deal with this. But the, the attack on the authority, if you read the book of Jude or Peter, they, they, they put together despising authority with sexual immorality. 
So yeah. the, the, so well, the, I think that they're, the, we're talking about self-loathing here because nothing, those sins are within the body, so they're especially uh, pressing, I think. The guilt you feel is inside, so you have a, a pressing need to project it outside of yourself, a more pressing need than, say, I don't know, well, it's, it's a, the sexual sin is the only sin that you sin against your own body. Right. So, so, so it's if you're a thief or, or whatever, you know, I'm not justifying theft, but basically it's outside the body. You know, it's not inside the body. So you have a more pressing need with these to, 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 to get it project off the self-loathing away from you. And what he found was the perfect vehicle for projection. And so suddenly we got this deal with Dolan and this guy McQuelly, and, and Voris is just... He's hitting his stride. You know, he's got this crowd. He goes to this parish, McQuelly's parish, and he's whipping the, the, the parishioners into a, a, a frenzy. And then he goes along and he says, all right, Dolan has to go, yes or no? Well, wait a minute, Michael. This is, this is the, the TV version of sadomasochism. You know, this is, this is right out of the bar and bathhouses of San Francisco, this type of behavior, except that it's now the psychic version uh, and it's uh, uh, religious sadomasochism, you know? But, I mean, that's, that's the point here. This is before the crisis. You can tell the guy is spinning out of control here, okay? This is not a rational view of the world or a way of dealing rationally with a problem. This is projection of self-loathing onto scapegoats, and he's just becoming more and more frenzied as, as the attack goes on. Right, because we saw, I've seen Dolan speak, and, and first of all, he's a very nice guy. He's from Wisconsin. And, uh, that, uh, that alone. <laughs> but he's, he's not a guy that, he has a lot of good qualities from, in my book. Now, whether he, you know, I don't think he attacks the issues. I think he's soft on that. But uh, what's your opinion? I mean, are these attacks of Boris legit in some fashion? Or it's the attitude that he brings with it. The well, the point is that the point is that uh, if you do this uh, and you you don't do it right, then you make the situation worse. So I think basically his his uh, crusade has basically now um, created a situation where a homosexual priest uh, who does not seduce minors is pretty much on his own. Nobody's going to stop him now. I think that that's, that's what the situation is. Now, this is a terrible situation for the Catholic Church, but this is what happens when you engage in this type of um, uh, what's what, narcissistic-driven crusade, which is basically projecting your self-loathing away from yourself. How, how would you phrase this? When he was younger, maybe fifth grade, they called him Gary the Fairy. Yeah. If you put yourself in fifth grade, you wouldn't use the word narcissist. I mean, that's not the words a fifth grader would use. How would how would a, a fifth grader confronted with somebody like this? What's the perception? He, he's not fitting in, right? Well, he doesn't fit in, so he withdraws. And this is where the narcissism begins. But that's a bad so, response. He well, should he should take. Yeah, the, I mean, but but basically, that's what that's what happens. I mean, I think that uh, the, the psychologist that I quoted, he, he really emphasizes peer group interaction much over uh, the father uh, relationship with the father and the mother. But basically, the dynamic here is that you've been singled out, you know, because of your behavior or because their perception of your behavior, you know, yeah. and uh, now you're different. Well, then this becomes your identity. In other words, I'm different. And right. then it does not not really much for, uh, law, much a uh, big distance between I'm different uh, I'm special, I'm special because of this. Uh, the world is against me, but I'm going to succeed. I mean, let's let's face it. Harry Potter novels are full of narcissism. They're all just narcissistic fantasies. You know, Harry Potter gets the the letter. He's living with Muggles, and they don't understand him. The people around me don't understand me. I'm really a genius. You know, I'm really a special person, uh, but they don't understand me. Uh, but then I got recognized by the Muggles Academy. Like, I had high SAT scores, and they brought me to Harvard. And now there's a group that's willing to promote me for my... So this is the type of dynamic that goes on here. It's also a reflection of a breakdown in the community where, where 
it, it just wouldn't have happened so much in the 50s and 60s, you know, where you're out playing, and if there was some boy... Well, we have all schools now that are dedicated to this proposition of promoting narcissism, fostering this homosexual behavior, for, because the, the people who control the culture love narcissism. I mean, the homosexual is... That's why the homosexual is the ideal citizen, because he's a narcissist. Well, why is that good from their point of view? Well, he has the image of himself as being a very powerful person, but in reality, he's very easily controlled. Right. And that's that's, the, that's the, 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 the gestalt that we're talking about here. That is why the culture, the dominant culture, is promoting homosexuality, because these people are easy to control. And so we have a, a mayor here who announces he's a homosexual, and basically what he's doing is, you know, doing the bidding of the oligarchs. Who appointed him? You know, they, they, they anoint him. The New York Times did an article, he's going to be the first gay president, right. this type of thing. This is exactly what I'm talking about. This whole idea of narcissism as a form of control, a control mechanism. But are people being narcissistic when they're promoting people like Michael Boris? I mean, I mean is, it, is he the only one? Because if they're... If he's well, representing our, our, so, everybody. So, so, you, so you create, so as we said, he created this engine that allowed him to affirm his narcissistic fantasy and simultaneously project the self-loathing away on other people. Well, this country was founded on a complete attack on authority, right? We yeah, did, so we it's attacked. natural there. But, uh, but I'm saying that there is a, uh, so we, let's talk about the group of people that you're appealing to. Well, there are groups of people here that are totally despised, okay? I mean, the Trump, what did Hillary Clinton call them? The deplorables? The deplorables, and that's like 48%. Yeah, 48 of the percent, according to Hillary Clinton, 48 of the pop, percent of the population is deplorable. So you've got a pool of people here where the resentment is kind of growing. And it's also true of the Catholic Church. In other words, you had these liberal, liberal pastors uh, who just trashed things Catholic, perhaps because they had sexual problems of their own. I mean, we know, well, look, let's take well, it. Does, it's, it does, it's a theory that does fit. I, mean, I think, it, look, you don't have to be a homosexual either. If there was ever a guy who no. hated homosexuals, it was Richard McBrien, the former chair of the theology department at Notre Dame. I mean, he used to thump his chest in public all the time. I about, never saw him, but I'm uh, be You know, sexual, oh. healthy people are sexually active. He's actually said this. So I felt like saying, well, are you healthy, uh, Father? Now, there was a guy, well, he was living with a woman. I had him in class. I took the okay? class Catholic. He had, he had this agenda that was based on his own sexual sins, and he just ran that, you know, that's what he was running with. That's He, he created this... This fantasy world, I mean, there was kind of narcissism. He wasn't a homosexual, but there was this kind of narcissism that we, he was involved in. And it had a tremendously distorting effect on the Catholic Church in this country because he was promoted because he was basically a loyal Americanist. He just loved America. And America was the agenda. And so basically you, his behavior created the reaction of basically a pool of very unhappy Catholics. Now, they are looking for someone to articulate their dissatisfaction. And you know, to be honest with you, I, artic I articulated, I mean, I wrote articles about Richard McBrien. It's not unusual. And now Michael Voris comes along and he's going to articulate too in a much more virulent fashion because the medium has changed now. But you're, you've been the one that's emphasizing the, the evil of uh, sexual immorality. Yeah. But, but, but if Jude and Peter, it, it connects. Once you defile yourself, there, then it, it, it moves itself to despising authority. And look at, if, I mean, half this country can't help but curse Hillary Clinton. I mean, it's just, they have to curse her. And the other half just has to curse Trump. So you have people just, that's not healthy for a nation. I mean, no, no. But I'm, all I'm saying is that let's say, well, like Hillary Clinton, like Richard McBrien, they create a pool of unhappy people. She calls them the deplorables. McBrien used to refer to people who believed in the Catholic faith, all of it as fundamentalist or something like that. And that group of people wants a leader to articulate what they're, what they're doing. So Boris was one of them. And many, in some sense, I was uh, the guy in the 1980s, you know, before I said things that he didn't like. 
Uh, Mother Angelic is another example. Right, you Mother had a big Ange- thing on Mother Angelica. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm sure I, I got uh, a lot of people upset. I always upset people. But, I mean, there was evidence that Mother Angelica succumbed to this narcissism. There's probably something about the medium that creates narcissism. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm, maybe I'm just trying to get myself off the hook, but there's a difference between standing in front of a camera, you know, day after day, and sitting down and editing and writing for a monthly magazine. You well, know, it's it, just where you, you have to withdraw from the immediacy of the thing. It just lends itself to reflection, the monthly magazine, in a way that this type of stuff does not. It absolutely does not lend itself to that. And so I think that Mother Angelica succumbed. The, the famous example, would, the beginning of it at least, was the, where she freaked out over the Stations of the Cross at the, when the Pope went to Denver. Oh, well, the one person was... They had, well, a, they had a woman portraying Christ. Yeah. yeah, obviously this is an abuse, but as I said in the article, it might have been better instead of going immediately to the camera and start denouncing, you know, Bishop Stafford. Why don't you call Bishop Stafford up and say what's going on? Mm-hmm. Because I think he was upset by the whole thing too. Which would that, you would do if if you grew up in the fifties and sixties? People grow up today. The the image is they're looking at their phone. They're looking at something else, but. The, the image I have of the 50s and 60s that uh, you kind of left home as quick as you could and then you're with your friends and you're literally almost looking at your friends all day, okay? You're, you're dealing with them all right. day. You're just right there doing something. You're wrestling. You know, it's a game. Yeah. Nobody is playing pinball, okay? I had one friend that in our town had pinball, you know, in the 60s and he broke up with his girlfriend, 7th, 8th grade. So he was sedating himself, you know, you know what's he do? you know he, you know cliff right <laughs> and he'd be taking hours and just playing a pinball game everybody knew he was sedating himself cuz he the girl dumped him but nobody was doing that normally no, everybody was engaging 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 face to face you had a local culture that has been disrupted now by these uh, electronic devices but i mean i'm saying the electronic devices disrupted the this program as well i mean so so the beginning is mother angelica freaks out over the Stations of the Cross. And there's a huge response. They love it. I mean, I, was, I watched it. Uh, you know, Ralph McInerney just went gaga over Mother Angelica because she freaked out. But they didn't see and the he downside. Was, he was a professor. He was a, you know, a great novelist, big philosopher, Aquinas specialist. And he went gaga over Mother well, Angelica. So, so, by the time, so by the time she gets around to dealing with Mahoney, you know, Cardinal Mahoney, well, I mean, she's... She's lost contact with reality. And so she got herself into a lot of trouble because uh, Mahoney filed a canonical lawsuit against her. And at that point, I think she staged that miraculous recovery. And Mahoney said, you know, it was so that I wouldn't look as if I were beating up a crippled nun. And the whole thing blew over. But, you know, it blew up. And I was, again, I was uh, 96. I was in Detroit for the 20th anniversary of the call to action. And I remember, I knew Mother Angelica, I mean, back in 81, when we were both getting started, it was shortly after that that I talked to her. Very nice lady, you know, real feminine maternal sense when you're talking to her. Well, she shows up at this conference and she's got the the stand-up comic routine down to a science. Right, you and, gave a talk, it was your biggest Yeah, audience. big lot. We had 2,000 people there, 2,000 angry ladies uh, who are not going to take it anymore. And Mother Angelica knows how to press their buttons, and she does press their buttons, and, you know, they love her. But at a certain point, she starts talking about the bishops, and her voice changes, and she starts this growl, and she says, if they try to take this station away from me, I'll blow it up, and the ladies all cheer. Well, that was her problem, okay? She backed away from the bishops and fell into the hands of the neocons who took over her station. But she's also... Pleasing the crowd. I mean, that's kind of right. A, so that's the, the problem. American crowd. That's the problem. That's, that's their the problem. DNA. That's their default position. That's yeah. Our- so Voris is was a more uh, exaggerated form because of his homosexuality. He had more self-loathing. I don't. I mean, Mother Angelica right. had a troubled childhood too. She was ridiculed as a child. I, I, there's no evidence of homosexuality there, but I mean, she had the. I think she had the kind of narcissistic wound. And you give the right conditions, it kind of comes out, you know? And it came out on the camera and, you know, 
The same thing with Voris, but Voris was, as I said, a much more exaggerated version because uh, his homosexual behavior exacerbated and exaggerated the homo, the the narcissism, and it became it just became an intolerable burden, and it had to be projected. Either you deal with it with penance, honestly, or you start projecting, and he obviously chose the root of projection. But the East Africans, uh, in a sense, they kind of say this is an, that's kind of an American problem. Don't they kind of think that? Well, yeah. I mean, first of all, I mean, East Africa was created uh, in reaction to homosexuality. Right. The center of East African Catholicism is the Ugandan martyrs. And they were all martyrs because they refused to go along with the homosexual advances of the king at that time. So this is what East Africa is. And you're going to come along as the big American and say, no, no, it's just a lifestyle. Well, they're not, that's not going to go. That's not going to fly there. They, it, they understand that that's our problem, and they just kind of you know, try and deal with it. Uh, and if you were an African, you're not, but if you were and you're looking at America, you'd be kind of going, what's wrong with those guys? And you'd kind of want to know, how'd they get like this? Yeah, and so it's bad enough when they tell you, you, you know, but when they, uh, you know, that you're backward. But when they tell, when you tell them they're backward because they don't support homosexuality, this is just, it's just ridiculous. But that's, that's the problem. So in many ways, they don't have that problem in East Africa. Okay, that's the issue there. We have the problem because we have division. And when you have division, there's always somebody rising to the top who's going to make the division worse. And that's precisely what Michael Forrest did. And that's precisely what started to weigh on the conscience of the spiritual advisor. Because people were coming to him and saying, look, he's, he's attacking the church. This is not a good idea. So you have this element of reaction rising, and at the same time, all the homosexuals are starting to say, well, I remember, I was on a gay cruise with this guy. Who does this guy think he is? And so these two things converge, and then you have the crisis. But, but the main reason that the, that doctor, I can't remember, it was like a Dutch name, was saying that this is this is a this is problematic. It, you, if somebody has this neurosis of homosexuality, you can't let them become a priest because being a priest, you have to have this fatherly, mature sense about yourself where you can minister to people with a with a right type of father. So, in other words, uh, you, not everybody can become a priest. It's not something where equality reigns here. And the church, uh, in its wisdom, has understands exactly what we're talking about. In other words, even if you don't act on these impulses, the wound is there. This narcissistic wound is there, and the wound is crippling. And, and, it, you, and it, 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 it's so crippling that it really prevents you from becoming a priest. You cannot become a priest, even, even if you don't act on it, if you have these inclinations, you're not going to become a priest. You know, maybe it's, you know, it's not fair. If you're missing fingers, you can't become a priest either. Sorry, but you need this to, as qualification. Because if the, if, the, if the idea is mainly peer, uh, peer, uh, failure to interact with your peers properly, that directly relates well, of course to how does. you are as your priest. You can't, That's that, what it, you're it, doing. It's, you're, it's more intense because you have to be a father. That's why you call the priest father. You have to be a father to all the people in your flock. You can only be a father if you could have, can peer out into the reality of the situation and understand the situation and try and deal with it. So someone's hurting. Uh, but with, with, with narcissism, I don't, do, you, do people take buses anymore? Uh, you know, do you ever take a bus at night? Yeah, I have. The yeah. light's on in the, inside the bus. Okay, when you look at the window, all you see is your reflection. You can't see out. Right. You can't see anything outside. All you can see is your reflection. This is what this narcissism is like. You can't see outside of your own reflection. And that's partly because of the sin. Because of the derangement. It's, it's like a, uh, you're encased in like the bus. You're in the bus at night. It's dark outside. There's a light on. You can't see out. That's what it means. And so all you're dealing with are the phantasms that you can see, see reflected what, on the window. What could have saved him? Like when I was in high school, because I, I, out of eighth grade, I was enrolled in the, the Holy Name Seminary out of Madison, but I didn't, I didn't follow through. But they'd call me Father Pete, you know, just because uh, like if somebody moved into town or let's say somebody's being picked on, well, then I saw my role as, okay, 
let's handle this correctly. Okay, let's, you know, so if somebody was there, Gary the fairy is obviously being left out, right? So ideally, somebody at that peer group yeah, is going to reach out the, and say, how can, can in we... Every, in every situation, your hope is that the grown-ups will show up and give you an accurate assessment of what's wrong and then actually deal with the situation. Yeah. Bring well, we, in live, we, live in a, we live in a country where the grown-ups never reach rise to any position of power. The only way you can get to any position of prominence in this culture is by being a narcissistic psychopath. <laughs> That's, you know, actually, we, I went home and I'm talking to my friends that I grew up with, and they're, t t they're telling me their careers, and it kind of like, yeah, I mean, it, it came to a, a halt because they weren't going to go any further. And who was and who was getting there? Well, well, look at the people. I mean, look at the people we're we're told to admire. I mean, much as I, you know, I, you know, much as uh, I'm, uh, you know, hope that uh, Trump gets elected, we can't deny the fact that he's a, a narcissist. He's a classic narcissist. You know, he's better than Hillary Clinton, but that's all we can hope for here. He's just like one more example of the kind of guy who rises to the top by believing his own press releases. Well, that's how he, that's how he had a sense that he could win. I, was, I saw him in New York City. I was you know, visiting with my friends, and I heard people screaming. And I go, what are they screaming? Well, they were, Trump and his wife were walking out of a restaurant, and they were, like, falling over in adulation. Yeah, well, this is part of the, part of the de deficiency, I think. It's, it's a deficiency that all of us have. But, I mean, that's the culture we live in. It's they're worshiping him probably because of capitalism. Qu why would they be worshiping? Why, why do they like well, Trump? Well, because he, he gained the system. You yeah. know, that's why he, could, he got expensive furniture in his apartment and that type of thing. But he won. I mean, he was able to make money. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a complicated, anomalous situation because in many ways, even though he's a billionaire, he's um, representing the, the common man and he's mobilizing that resentment that these people who have been pushed aside, like Indiana, for example, is considered, you know, somewhere subhuman compared to the people on the either coast. Uh, but anyway, I mean, what you're saying, so what you saw here was the confluence of these two pressures, and Michael had to, he had a crisis on his hand. And the, the situation was going to be, how, how are you going to handle the crisis? And, uh, you know, there were people who wanted him to just go quietly, which I think would have been the better solution. Oh, yeah. No, people have gone quietly. Now, uh, you, you cited Weakland, uh, uh, Bishop Weakland in Milwaukee. He didn't go quietly. He didn't go quietly. And then there was somebody. He's that, still complaining that the church has maltreated him, and he's the martyr. He's like a classic narcissistic homosexual. You know, poor me. You know, he wrecked the cathedral. He was just a he was just a, a ruthless wrecker. Hated the Catholic Church. Had did everything he could to destroy it, and now he's all going around saying, "Poor me." He should have gone into a monastery, and we never should have heard from him again. But no, he's on the homosexual circuit, the lecture circuit. They should have feeling, made him go. Feeling, well, they can't make him go. I mean, what oh. are you going to do? They don't have the power of the state. Okay. They can say, "Yes, you can go," and if you don't, it'll be under pain. This is obedience <laughs> under pain of sin. He's a Benedictine. Okay, I'm sure he had some type of spiritual advisor. But if he says no, well, then what are you going to do? You can't throw him in jail. You don't have a you don't have police power. So that was the choice that, that uh, Michael made. And, and well, now, he was like, on a, on a Protestant level, I mean, uh, there's no comparison as far as numbers, but Jimmy Swaggart had 500 million people listening to him every week. Right. And then, and then when they wanted, him, they wanted him to do penance, they wanted him to take a year off, which probably would have been a good thing, but he wouldn't do it. Yeah, because what you've set up is this craving. You need this attention. Or you need this adulation, adulation, because that's what helps you project your self-loathing. As soon as the applause stops, the self-loathing returns, and that would be a real crisis. I think that would be the crisis. You know, sitting in your monk's cell, you know, praying, and all of these memories come. It would be it would be a tough time, but that's what you have to go through. You have to face it. You have to do penance. You have to admit that you were wrong. But he chose the the path of narcissism, the path of least narcissistic resistance. And in many ways, he's going to punish himself. He's punishing himself because now every time he goes in front of the camera, he knows that they know, you know, 
that he's the, really Gary. The cat, the, the cat is out of the bag. He's essentially now Gary. he has to go through the motions of being the big macho defender of the face when everybody knows it's just his narcissistic homosexual fantasy. Well, it probably didn't help going to Notre Dame. That didn't that didn't address his the, his, the weakness of Gary the fairy. Okay, so Notre Dame didn't help. Being in media didn't help. No. And then the condition of the church didn't help. And the country doesn't help. So the it's, country it's doesn't just, help. It's like all of these forces coming together and creating so this. So he can't, this even, train he can't even see it. Like, like, like this other article, that, the last one that just came in, it was kind of saying that he doesn't think Boris even sees it. Well, the narcissism is so... As I said, the image is like sitting on that bus. And if, if the lights are really bright and it's really dark outside, you can't see anything but your own reflection. That's all you see. But that's still no excuse. Everything is me. Everything, it's all about me. No excuse, would you say? I mean, he's... And Paul says these people are without excuse. Yeah. Because what can be known was known by them. But that's not me to judge. That's between him and God. I tried to, I was willing to help. Uh, but, you know, he chose the road of, I'm going to, it's all about me. It's all about me and my fantasy of myself as the great church reformer. Now everybody knows you're just projecting yourself loathing, so it's, it must be torture for this guy. But, it, you know, this is what they choose oftentimes. You choose to torture yourself rather than to accept the reality because you're afraid of the reality. The reality is just too terrible. You spent your whole life fighting off that reality. But he wasn't, he wasn't free from the desire for money, capitalism. Cause it, cause no, it he all, got, he it got all caught. fits together. It's, it's called an apostolate. You know, Nelson Algren said every cause begins, or every movement begins as a cause and ends as a racket. And that's pretty true, I think, you know. Well, unless there's vow, I mean, uh, you know, in the, the basic... There's got to be my, some type a of A vow check. of poverty, chastity, well, and the, obedience. The, the Those checks, were to check that. The checks would have already basically uh, denied him the ministry. Because he was in the seminary, he was uh, rejected from the seminary, and instead of just accepting it and moving on, this resentment grew, and now he's going to take revenge on the people who rejected him. He knew McQuelly in the seminary. So you have to think, well, McQuelly got away with the same thing that he's doing. He's a pastor. How, why am I being singled out? This is unfair. I'm going to show Well, them. spiritual immaturity, you said that really is a code word for the gay uh, homosexuality. Right. So they're, they're kind of playing with deceiving them, so they shouldn't even use that term. I mean, homosexuality, practicing homosexuality, and they use the term spiritual immaturity. They're kind of hiding it by their terms. Well, we, you know, this is part of the problem. Part of the problem is there is a problem, a homosexual problem. The dominant culture is promoting it. There are homosexual priests who want to promote this as well. Uh, they've got the self-loathing. They're promoting it. So it's, you know, it's one, but it, one, it goes one back. layer over another. It, it goes back in, what, 64, I was an altar boy. And the girl in my class, it was her brother, that was the priest that was teaching us. And a few years after that, he leaves the priesthood, he gets a lover, and he's been in San Francisco ever since. Going into eighth, out of eighth grade, I went to the, the, the Holy Name Seminary, and I said, this place seems kind of weird. And I, I decided to postpone it. But my sister's, um, uh, I mean, these two classmates who had, a, one, one was a priest, the other one, they, they said, oh, it was a, it was, I was fortunate that I didn't go. Because people were being swept yeah, into it's these the things. Achilles See, heel. The Achilles heel of a celibate clergy is homosexuality. That's obvious. And they have to be extremely rigorous in rooting it out because they will take over and destroy the priesthood. And they weren't during the 60s in some of these places. They were just beginning at that point. The, 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 uh, for the most part, the priests who were heterosexuals left when they realized they couldn't get married, ran off with some woman. And so on and so forth. So people going so in we have, innocently. We, we have we have the crisis. Every look, I've been dealing with this crisis for thirty five years. Everything that's bad has now been made worse because this thing blew up in his face. And the longer you persist, the longer he's going to torture himself. The 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 the, the, I, I, the people, the spiritual director, is if anything more adamant about what he said than when he said it before. 
I think that if there's anything, he regrets that he didn't do something sooner, that he let this thing get out of hand. But, you know, this will play out. It's going to play out one way or the other. But, I mean, you've got all of these forces basically promoting this type of division. That's what it comes down to. There are people who love this type of division. And that's why uh, they were rushing to promote Michael Boris. There are people who are just gullible, who are disgruntled, who don't understand why they've been marginalized, and they need someone to articulate their point of view. But it would be better, it'd be better if, if the church had sent out a priest or, or somebody else to address these problems. It would be better if we didn't have a crisis in the church. That's absolutely true. But unfortunately, we do have a crisis. But when you have a crisis, you need good priests. You need good people you don't, that are you mature. You don't want to undermine the authority that is basically the solution to the crisis. And you need discernment to say, well, this needs to be talked about. And uh, discernment to say, this uh, is better if I talk to someone privately. And so on and so forth. Well, Thomas Paine wrote, uh, he, he wrote uh, Common Sense, but he also wrote The Crisis. You know, we had a crisis, and the answer was <laughs> tear down the authority. Right. So it's not, we're not, uh, it's not uh, the first time this has happened here. That's you what Amer Americans gravitate to that, that choice to tear down authority. I mean, I mean, you see it in the election. You, you see it in the church. You see it all over the place. The solution is bad mouth. Clinton, bad mouth Trump. That is not a good solution. You know, you are not to speak evil of the ruler of the people. In fact, if you curse your father, you're to be put to death. Well, father, and then the leader of the country, uh, if you did it under, under a, a healthy leader, if you did it under a king, yeah. he wouldn't let you do it. Yeah. So the book is uh, available on Kindle. We'll have a paper copy of the book out soon. The culture, the back issues of Culture Wars, uh, I think, are all we've sold out all of those editions. So we'll wait for the book. Okay, now the I was story. surprised they called the book because it's just an article in these two. No, it's how, two. How, it's two articles. Right, right. It's two articles, but but how many pages is the book? Would you say? I mean, you <laughs> yeah. know, your other it, book was eight hundred pages. Yeah, now you got this on one. A typeface. It depends on all kinds of different things. Okay, it's, but I mean, this took me a while to read it, it because it's a it, book. It, it, it's a long article. It's a short book. However you want to deal with it, but yeah. it will be out as a book. Right. So go to Kindle, Amazon. You can buy a copy, uh, electronic version, or you can write to Culture Wars. Go to our website, and we'll have the paper copy out soon. And what do you think? Uh, he still has a choice. He still could do the right thing and go through the penance. Uh, sure, you can go up, to a monastery. He can repent up until the day he dies and do penance, do whatever. He's, he's, I still think there's a chance for him. Okay. Um, I don't know how much time we have left. We have one minute. Oh, boy. Okay. Um, time sure flies when you're having fun, <laughs> doesn't it? <laughs> Are you writing anything, doing anything? Yeah, I'm always writing something. Are you going anywhere? Yeah, I'm going places, too. Okay. And okay. I'm back from places, too. Okay, so they, they can find you on Culture Wars? Yeah, and we'll do, we'll do uh, something on Tanzania soon. Okay. The trip to Tanzania, that's going to be a book, a biography of Julius Nerera and the whole issue of development economics. So there's always something going on here. Okay, so people should pray for your health, pray for uh, that God keeps you going, because you do yes, have things to say. Yes, thank you. We all need prayers. Right. Okay. Uh, this is the show Israel. I believe Jesus is Israel, and if you believe in Jesus, you become part of Israel. So, um, till next time, this is Dr. E. Michael Jones and Peter Helen. <laughs>